the United Kingdom today. A council estate built in the early 1950s. Here, about half the men are out of work. It is usually policed by the army. This is its shopping centre. The Catholic Bally Murphy estate in Belfast. The shopping centre in Belfast is different too. No one enters without being searched. In every shop inside this citadel, you're searched again. Behind these scenes is a deceptively simple conflict. In Northern Ireland, two thirds of the population are Protestant and one third Catholic. Most Protestants want to remain part of the United Kingdom. Most Catholics wish to be part of the rest of Ireland. This conflict erupted 12 years ago and these streets have seen riots, burnings and deaths overlaid by the urban decay of a depressed city. This tiny province of one and a half million people living in an area not much larger than Yorkshire has been for over a decade in a state of civil disorder and on occasion has faced the real threat of open civil war. This is the more familiar image of Ulster, the Orange Order to which many Protestants belong, marching to celebrate Protestant victories of the 17th century. These marches call on history to affirm today's determination to remain in the United Kingdom. As the minority within a Catholic Ireland, the Protestants have always felt beleaguered. They remember their history as siege. Others in Ireland remember history differently. Here in Carrickmore, the Catholics of Northern Ireland celebrate the Easter Rising. In 1916, a handful of Irishmen rose in armed rebellion against the British. Their history is of resistance to British rule. They're determined to break the British connection. History in these streets is one long remembered yesterday. Where there are deep, unresolved conflicts, history is called upon to justify actions and to sustain grievances. That history has witnessed war, violence and rebellion across the centuries in what the Irish call the Troubles. In the present phase of the Troubles, the British Army polices the streets in the Catholic areas and holds the line between the Catholic and Protestant communities.
But soldiers are not new to Ireland. The British army and the British influence they represent have been in Ireland for several centuries. Troubles in Northern Ireland today have their roots in the period of history that saw the British conquest of Ireland. Five hundred years ago, Ireland had an identity, language, culture and social order distinct from England. Like other countries, Ireland absorbed the influences and ideas of conquerors who had come and gone, each leaving reminders of their presence on the land. Picts, Celts, Vikings, Normans, all had come to Ireland. These influences merged with the distinctive tradition of Roman Catholicism which had been kept alive in Ireland during Europe's Dark Ages. Together they produced the uniquely Gaelic culture and heritage of Ireland. The day before he suffered, he took bread in his sacred hands and looking up to heaven to you, his almighty Father, he gave you thanks and praise. He broke the bread gave it to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. This has had a lasting effect on Ireland. Today, the majority of the population is still Catholic, and the Catholic Church and its ideas have a dominant position in Irish society. Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, it will be shed for you and for all men, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. In the Republic of Ireland, it is estimated that 90% of the people attend Mass at least once a week. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. 500 years ago, all of Christian Europe was Catholic, under the authority of the Pope in Rome. But by 1500, the Catholic Church was becoming decadent and corrupt. Those who began to reject the Church of Rome in protest became known as Protestants. This reformation of the Church, a revolution of spiritual ideas, began in North Germany and soon spread to other countries in Europe, including England. Such a vast religious upheaval had great political ramifications. In a divided Europe, England found itself surrounded by Catholic powers, with Catholic Ireland at its back door. This was very critical to England. Here was a Catholic country on its doorstep, which it hadn't got proper control of, which it didn't only govern a part of, really, in any effective way. And Catholic powers were ready to land there, or harbour there, or whatever. And so Ireland, from that point on, was indeed for the next three centuries, becomes of extraordinary strategic importance to the British and also to Britain's enemies. If the Catholic powers of Europe formed an alliance with Catholic Ireland, then Protestant England would be threatened from two sides. It was this vision of Europe that worried the Tudor monarchs. Henry VIII decided that Ireland should be brought into the orbit of England. This policy was continued by Elizabeth I, who concluded that Gaelic civilization would have to be crushed. There had been an English presence in Ireland since the 12th century, now limited to an area around Dublin called the Pale, shown in red. There had also been a continuous Scottish migration to the northeast, which is only 13 miles from Scotland at the nearest point. But it was a series of Gaelic risings, beginning in Leash Offaly, that gave the English the opportunity to suppress the Irish. 
In the southwest, loyal English settlers were planted on the lands of the defeated Gaelic nobility, and in Monaghan, more land was confiscated from the local chieftains. But this left one of the most Gaelic regions of Ireland still fiercely resistant to English rule. An English expeditionary force was sent out to put down the rebellious province of Ulster in the north. They were to face Ulster rebels reinforced with Spanish troops. However, in the end, the Gaelic armies could not match the tight ranks of Elizabethan cavalry. The Ulster men were defeated in battle. Their leaders were too proud to submit themselves to the humiliation of foreign occupation. Later, they fled from Ulster, leaving their lands open for the taking. So, the largest plantation of all took place. In 1609, the six Gaelic counties of Ulster were systematically planted with loyal English and Scottish settlers. It established in Ireland a Protestant landowning aristocracy, essentially a Protestant ruling class through the various confiscations and gifts of land from the 16th and 17th century. It provided Ireland with a depressed Catholic community who had lost power, who had lost prestige, who had lost land. Now Gaelic Ireland yielded to English authority. The new settlers were forced to build castles to defend themselves. These Protestant sentinels were seen as bastions of Anglo-Scottish rule in Ulster. The settlers also brought with them a new culture, a new language and new laws. As arable farmers, they leveled the forests and tilled the soil in a different way to the pastoral Irish. Their houses looked different. Their castles were built on the English model with a keep surrounded by a stockade. But Gaelic civilization was not destroyed, merely overlaid with this new, powerful Anglo-Scottish landowning class. They saw themselves, I suppose, as colonizers, sometimes even as civilizers, because they brought their own customs and their own uh, mental luggage with them, and they simply um, expected that uh, the natives would either adopt those customs or would keep themselves to themselves and not interfere with the settlers. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Part of the mental luggage of these new settlers was their Protestantism. Many were Anglican Protestants, but there were also a large contingent of dissenters, the majority being Presbyterian. They brought energy and enterprise to building a new life in Ulster. And the power and the glory, forever and forever. Amen. The descendants of these settlers are the Protestants of Ulster. In Northern Ireland today, they still form a majority of the population. Attendance at a church service in Northern Ireland is an important affirmation of identity. The Catholics at Mass, the Protestants at worship. Demon object, after he accepts Jesus Christ, is always to live for others. Retrospect, it was religion that provided the most obvious source of division between the Anglo-Scottish and the Irish. It became a badge for all the political, cultural and racial differences between settler and native. The Ulster plantation left the native resentful and the settler beleaguered. Religion became the justification for any injustice or outrage. To the Irish, the plantation castles symbolized the alien regime which had seized their land. The dispossessed banded together to nurse their grievances. Sporadic attacks on isolated settlements culminated in a bloody rising in 1641. Historians still disagree as to what happened. Mythology and history have become entangled. However, in Protestant England, the rumors of massacres of planter settlements were widely believed and provoked outrage and horror. A true relation of the bloody massacre and damnable treason of the cruel papists. An impression of the hysteria evoked by rumours of the rising comes from this pamphlet written by an English Presbyterian. 
driving men, women, and children by hundreds upon bridges and casting them into rivers. Those who drowned not were killed Pulling with poles and shot by the hair muskets. on their heads, dashing the children's brains against the posts. They tore off his ears and nose, tore off his cheeks, then cut off his arms and legs. The minister was hanged, and the flesh was pulled from his bones in his wife's sight. They stripped the two eldest children who were seven years of age, roasted them on spits before their parents' faces. They cut their throats and afterwards murdered them. As the survivors began to straggle into the walled towns and places of refuge from the isolated farms and plantation castles, bringing with them horrific stories of atrocity, uh, there was created an atmosphere uh, which was very special and which was to be repeated again and again in every subsequent crisis that the Protestants faced. The stories of atrocity would not be forgotten, creating a lasting mentality of siege. Protestants now anxiously looked out from behind their castle walls. Having defeated the king in the Civil War, the new English Parliament sent Oliver Cromwell to Ireland in 1649 with clear instructions to reconquer the country for England and for Protestantism. With accounts of 1641 still ringing in their ears, Cromwell's army embarked on a Protestant crusade to punish the Irish. This was to be a lesson. It was meant to be a punitive lesson for those who had rebelled. And it was also meant to be a reprisal for what had been dis uh, disclosed as Catholic massacres of Protestants in 1641. So it was deliberately meant effectively to strike terror. By the time the Cromwellian reconquest of Ireland was complete, there were English garrisons like this one on the west coast throughout Ireland. During his swift, efficient campaign, Cromwell decided to make examples of Drogheda and Wexford. Men, women and children in both towns were slaughtered. Cromwell wrote of his actions with a sense of almost divine mission. It hath pleased God to bless our endeavours at Drogheda. I wish that all honest hearts may give the glory of this to God alone, to whom indeed the praise of this mercy belongs. This is a righteous judgment of God upon those barbarous wretches who have imbrued their hands in so much innocent blood. The ruins of Cromwell's presence still remain in Ireland, and the memory of him lingers in the Irish mind. Cromwell was a real tyrant. He was hated by the, the Irish people. The sense of grievance is still evoked in the Irish folk memory. Cromwell intended to exterminate them. That was the only way to beat them. After every massacre like God, Cromwell went and prayed out of his Bible and gave thanks to the Lord that he dealt with these miscreants in the thousands. He really believed he was doing the Lord's work. Well, Cromwell massacred the Irish out of a face I don't think anyone ever was as cruel to the Irish as Cromwell. As a result of the Cromwellian reconquest, many Irish were driven to the barren lands of the West. Their fertile lands had been taken from them and given to Cromwell's soldiers and others to whom the government owed money. But when the Irish heard that a king sympathetic to the Catholics had replaced rule by Parliament, their hopes rose. The accession of a Catholic, James II, in 1685, further renewed optimism amongst the Irish Catholics that their land might soon be restored to them. There was a growing hope and optimism among the Catholics, particularly among the remnants of the Catholic aristocracy, that a, a, a policy of what we might call positive discrimination 
in favour of Catholics was only the prelude to a more general revision of land ownership and, in fact, an attempt to roll back the tide of Protestant plantation throughout the 17th century. Enthusiasm for James II in Ireland was more than matched by hostility to him in England. The Protestant ruling class decided he must be removed. Overtures were made to his son-in-law, William of Orange, ruler of the Netherlands, and a champion of the Protestant cause in Europe. William was secretly offered the English crown. In a bloodless coup, James fled. He went to the court of the most powerful Catholic king in Europe, Louis XIV of France. William of Orange became king, securing the Protestant faith in England. James crossed to Catholic Ireland to begin his reconquest of England. Backed with French troops, in 1689 James laid siege to the Protestant garrison of Londonderry. The city was under siege for 15 weeks. The siege itself has become a kind of series of tableau, cycle of uh, myths really, which have been preserved and handed down through the generations. Um, and clearly its symbolical significance for the uh, Protestants was very considerable. Here they had withstood the armies of James II, they had uh, suffered greatly, had great privations, and in the end the city had been relieved and William III had come to their rescue and established their cause. And I think this was why the siege of Londonderry becomes enshrined in Protestant mythology. <laughs> Every year, the Protestants of Londonderry march through the city to remember their victory. The heroic resistance of the defenders of Londonderry has become a symbol of Ulster Protestant fortitude and loyalty to the English crown. But the crucial battle came a year later. William had no real interest in Ireland, but crossed to Ulster to continue his struggle against France. On the 1st of July, 1690, on the banks of the River Boyne, the predominantly Dutch army of King William met the French army of King James and settled the destiny of Ireland. King William won a decisive victory in the battle. It is remembered each year as the Orangemen march through the streets of Northern Ireland to commemorate the glorious and immortal memory of King Billy and the Boyne. King Billy routed the Catholics and James fled. It was the third major defeat of the Catholic Irish in a hundred years. This time it was final. For the Protestants, King Billy has become their hero and the battle has come to represent Protestant triumph in Ireland. Each year they swagger and strut through the streets of Northern Ireland in celebration of their triumph over the Catholics. The Battle of the Boyne is really the turning point uh, for Protestants in Ireland. It reversed the trend of the previous two reigns. And it, after the Battle of the Boyne, the Protestant ascendancy was established in Ireland for a long time to come. And that is, I think, one reason why the memory which uh, keeps, is kept alive of the Battle of the Boyne by the Protestants is perhaps a kind of true instinct acknowledging the importance of this as a turning point in their fortunes. But drums that beat for Protestant triumph also toll for Catholic defeat. When the Orange Men march, it is an annual reminder to the Catholics of their defeat nearly 300 years ago.
After the defeat of the Catholics by King William, Irish Catholicism entered a dark age. The Protestants set about buttressing their power with a series of laws directed at all other religious groups, including the Presbyterians. But their main impact was upon the Irish Catholic community. An act for the better securing the government by disarming papists. Catholics were not allowed to vote, nor become members of Parliament. They were banned from holding public office. They could not carry arms. An act to prevent popish priests from coming into this kingdom. The Catholic priesthood was suppressed. Exiled priests could be hanged, drawn and quartered if they returned. An act to prevent the further growth of popery. Catholics were prohibited from buying land, taking mortgages on it, or leasing it for more than 31 years. The laws of inheritance were changed, favoring Protestants at the expense of Catholics. In 1640, over 50% of the land of Ireland had been owned by Catholics. By the mid-18th century, they owned only 7%. Moreover, religious worship for the Catholic majority was outlawed. The Mass sometimes had to be said in the open air, in wild, out-of-the-way spots called Mass Rocks, away from the watchful eyes of the authorities. The priest was on the run then, and the people wanted a Mass, and it was said mostly in hidden glens and valleys. And when the priest was saying Mass, there was always people on guard. They were looking out for the soldiers coming to arrest the priest if they could find him and the people that would be attending the Mass. The Mass was banned. There was a price of five pound on the head of a priest and five pound on the head of a wolf and five pound on the head of a teacher. The intention of the penal code was to create, in effect, a permanent subject condition for the Catholics of Ireland, to keep the Catholics of Ireland in a position of permanent second-class citizenship, as it were. As the century progressed, the penal laws fell into abeyance, but it was the effect they had on people that was significant, the myth rather than the reality that mattered. The penal laws are really a psychological weapon to humiliate and degrade and demoralize the Irish Catholic majority so that they would be psychologically incapable of rebelling again. Three quarters of Ireland was owned by English or Anglo-Irish families whose country mansions dominated the landscape. But many of the landlords lived abroad and rents and revenues were constantly leaving Ireland for England. The profit that England drew from Ireland was vast. Roughly speaking, Ireland was as valuable to England in the mid-18th century as North Sea oil and gas is to the British economy today. All European countries at this time treated their colonies as investments to be exploited. Ireland was no exception. You've got to think of Ireland as the first English empire, but it was the first important, profitable colony that was, of course, improving England's economic uh, situation in all sorts of ways, creating surplus capital for investment of every kind. Not only the peasantry, but also the business classes suffered from this exploitation. They were annoyed by restrictive trade legislation favouring England's economy at the cost of Ireland's. Presbyterians, as well as Catholics, suffered disabilities under the penal laws. Resentment festered and erupted in a rising in 1798, which was viciously put down by Britain. Despite French help, the rising was a fiasco. Leaderless and uncoordinated, it degenerated into a sectarian fury. The ferocity with which it was put down by the British army left a lasting impression. Tens of thousands of Irishmen were killed by the security forces.
but Republicans too celebrate their heroes and martyrs. The man who inspired the 1798 Rising is buried here. Today, he's revered as the founder of Irish Republicanism. His name was Theobald Wolfe Tone. His words have inspired many Irish nationalists. From my earliest youth, I have regarded the connection between Ireland and England as the curse of the Irish nation, and felt that while it lasted, this country could never be free or happy. Every year, Republicans march to his grave. These marches and the speeches accompanying them have become affirmations of Irish republicanism. Friends, I am very proud to be speaking to you here today at the grave of Theobald Wolfe Town. In this, the tenth year of our phase of the struggle. I would like to take this opportunity for Republican separatists, 1798 is the crucial point of departure in that for all its internal contradictions, for all of the, the various problems that one had in explaining how things happened, it did see a rebellion in which Catholics and Protestants were together in arms against a British government, in which the right of Ireland to a separate political existence and to a republic was asserted in arms by Catholics and by Protestants, North and South. The British government's response was radical and decisive. Ireland was to be made a part of Britain. To Westminster, the 1798 Rising was a reminder of Irish treachery. Union of Ireland and Britain would finally ensure Irish compliance. Britain and Ireland were fused into what was now to be called the United Kingdom. The streets of Dublin came to look like those of London. But the countryside was different. Ireland's natural agriculture is pasture and dairy farming. It is a green and wet land. But the colonial relationship with Britain was having a profound effect. Ireland was becoming a country of tillage, a granary for England. More land was brought into cultivation, supporting more people. The population grew from 3 million in 1760 to 8 million by 1840. The Irish peasants subsisted on the potato. What else was produced paid the rent. With increased population, people were forced onto the marginal lands. The ridges high on the mountain slopes where potatoes were grown can still be seen. So by the 1840s, the majority of Ireland's huge agricultural population was entirely dependent upon one crop, the potato. The agriculture of Ireland had been transformed to meet the needs of the British economy. This was a highly unnatural form of agriculture, really. What was developing was basically a sick agricultural economy. So that by 1840, uh, a situation had arisen where the cottiers, the farm labourers, the people at the bottom of the agricultural system were really in a highly vulnerable and dangerous position. In September 1845, people first began to notice the disease of the potato crop, the blight. As the leaves of the crop withered and died, the potato turned into a mushy pulp in the ground. The peasants watched their potatoes perish. The disease thrived in 1846, but abated somewhat in 1847. In 1848, the crop failed completely. Initially, tens of thousands went hungry. Then hundreds of thousands began to starve. Before the blight released its grip, a million were dead of starvation and fever. The same disease hit the potato crop in the rest of Europe. But no other economy was as vulnerable as Ireland's. Only Ireland witnessed famine. Uh, 
the British government tried to do something about the famine. It was the first time a government had ever tried to ameliorate the consequences of a natural disaster of this magnitude. Yet it was completely beyond the imagination and the resources of the Victorian state to cope with a tragedy of this proportion. By 1849, the toll could be counted. The land was depopulated. Villages like these were left abandoned. Ireland was enveloped by a bitter melancholy. The great hunger still haunts the Irish memory. And I've heard of the dead that was green round their mouths because they were living on what they could gather in the ditches down the line uh, far. The pangs of hunger caused them to eat anything they could get their hands on to, to keep them alive. We always say um, that uh, God caused the potato blight, but uh, the landlords caused the famine. You see, to call it a famine is a misnomer. There was no famine in Ireland. It was just hunger. There was plenty of food. Oats, barley, wheat, cattle, sheep, pigs. But these things had to be sold to pay the rent. Yeah. Oh, tragic. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, the famine uh, destroyed Ireland. It... it uh, it destroyed the, the Irish. As British officials bungled the organization of relief, the Irish began to blame the British government for failing to relieve the famine. Some thought it was part of a British policy of genocide against the Irish. Although this was untrue, there was still a lingering suspicion that had such a catastrophe happened in the home counties, then a million people would not have died. Even those who were not prepared to formulate their charge against Britain in such high terms as genocide, and there were some who did, in fact, who believed that it was willful neglect in order to solve a Malthusian population problem. But even those who didn't go that far cited the famine again and again as the ultimate statement of British unfitness to rule Ireland. The fact that it had actually happened, that such massive loss and horrific loss had taken place and that the government had allowed it to take place, seemed to be in itself a major statement of British unfitness to rule Ireland. Not all of the people in these hovels died. Some simply left, taking passages for the new world. With no opportunity for a decent life at home, Ireland was losing its sons and daughters in huge numbers. In the ten years after the appearance of the potato blight, nearly two million left Ireland seeking new lives in new lands. One person in four. The population of Ireland today is still only about half of what it was in 1840.
The famine helped to stabilize Irish agriculture. The land was now more able to support the population. But the core of the problem still remained, land ownership. Much of the land was still owned by alien, sometimes absentee landlords. Rents were still high. The peasantry still lived in dreadful poverty. Those who could not afford the rent were evicted, like the family in this photograph. Those evicted faced total destitution and the prospects of starvation or emigration. A land league was established to mobilize the peasantry. Campaigns were mounted against rack-renting landlords. Rent strikes were organized. But still the evictions continued. These photographs record one such eviction in County Clare in the late 1880s. The tenants would barricade themselves into their homes. The landlord would come to oversee the proceedings, and the eviction was carried out by hired henchmen. A battering ram would be used to break into the cottages of the tenants. The police and the British Army were often on hand to defend the landlord's interests. After the tenants were evicted, their cottages were made uninhabitable to prevent reoccupation. The evicted families could only look to a bleak future. The president of the Land League was Charles Stuart Parnell, who also led the Irish Nationalist MPs at Westminster. As a counterpoint to the agitation on the land, Parnell pursued a strategy of delaying, obstructing, and hampering the business of Westminster. With Parliament almost paralysed, British politicians were forced to look at Ireland. Gladstone had long tried to reform Ireland. He eventually decided that only home rule would suffice. But as an old man, Gladstone saw his home rule proposals defeated. But slowly, the land question was tackled. Gladstone had begun the process of land reform in Ireland. A series of acts aided the transfer of the land from landlords to tenants. In the first two decades of the 20th century, nine million of Ireland's 22 million acres were handed back to tenant farmers. It looked as though gradual reform by Parliament was pacifying Ireland where everything else had failed. All of the grievances that really gave birth to Irish nationalism and, and nourished it through the 19th century, had pretty much been rectified. Tenant farmers uh, owned their farms. They were no longer tenant farmers or peasant proprietors. Catholic emancipation had been granted, and British government had spent money in public works, and they had given money to the congested districts, and uh, they had financed the national school system in the country. And uh, so that, that in economic and social terms, that Ireland had made great progress. But by 1900, nationalism had taken on a momentum of its own. It had become separate from, from the things that created it, from the grievances that created and nourished it. And that uh, nationalism was, it was a vital living thing in itself. And it was too late to solve the national question by remedying social and economic grievances. County Carlow, 1913. The Irish demonstrate support for another home rule proposal before Parliament. A minority was deeply opposed to this bill. The Ulster Protestants said they would fight to defend the Union with Britain. Despite this offer of only limited devolution, most Irish nationalists cheered their parliamentary leaders. However, new forces were at work. In 1913, Dublin saw a series of bitter industrial disputes. With the docks idle, armed police distributed essential supplies in the city. The intellectual of the Irish labour movement was James Connolly, a revolutionary socialist born in Scotland. His was a socialist vision of a free Ireland. The national and economic freedom of the Irish people must be sought in the establishment of an Irish socialist republic and the consequent conversion of the means of production, distribution and exchange into the common property of society. Although he drew on new ideas which were fermenting in much of Europe at the time, Connolly also called on older traditions from the Irish past. The social radicalism of the 1790s, translated into 20th century language and represented by James Connolly, was the Workers' Republic. The idea that political and, and, uh, and social uh, change were linked 
and that a sovereign Irish state would be a fairer state, would in fact be socially a more just society than that which it would replace. In the countryside, the Irish still harboured a lasting resentment of Britain. They look back to the traditions of the old, free, Gaelic Irish nation. Ireland, not free only, but Gaelic as well. Not Gaelic only, but free as well. Irish cartoons of the time clearly express this spirit. Gaelic Ireland could rise, throw off British rule, and be free. This caught the imagination of the Irish poets and scholars. The interest in the legends and traditions of the past led to a revival of Gaelic language and literature, which gave Irish nationalism a new spirit of self-confidence and of cultural identity, a romantic vision of the past and hope for the future. And into that romantic nationalist, cultural nationalist stream, there also went the, the more enduring physical force, separatist, single-minded pursuit of independence, which was the Fenian tradition, which was 1798. This tradition was to be seen at the funeral of a famous Irish patriot, O'Donovan Rossa, in 1915. He'd been involved in one of the two armed uprisings against British rule in the 19th century. A poet and schoolmaster called Patrick Pierce spoke the funeral oration. The defenders of the realm think they have pacified Ireland. But the fools, the fools, the fools, they have left us our Fenian dead. And while Ireland holds these graves, Ireland, on free, shall never be at peace. With England now taken up in fighting the war to end all wars with Germany, Irish nationalism seemed to be moving towards a more remorseless assertion of Irish identity. No strings attached, a sovereign Irish state, a republic, end of story, and it to be achieved in arms. Republicans had an army, the Irish volunteers. Well armed and drilled, they were awaiting their opportunity. Orders for mobilisation went out for Easter, 1916. Dublin had been used to the volunteers and the British Army marching and counter-marching around the country. So they didn't take any particular notice of uh, the volunteers coming out on Easter Monday morning. Everybody was taken by surprise. Dublin had been in a holiday mood. The famous ferry house races started on Easter Monday morning. We were told to stand by on the following day on Easter Monday. Uh, around about nine o'clock in the morning, we got an order to mobilize and to report to Liberty Hall. The 1916 Rising brought together the different elements of Irish nationalism. There is no film of the Rising itself, only its aftermath. To deal with the 1500 rebels, the British had rushed troops to Dublin. British soldiers set about dislodging the rebels from their seven strongholds. In a, in a lull in the fighting, they rushed into a number of houses and they had been told by some of our neighbours that we were Republican and they came into our downstairs into the kitchen and uh, we were there and they heard us talking English. And one said to the other, blimey, they're talking English. So I turned to the young recruit, he was almost looked like a boy, and I said, where do you think you are? Oh, he said, we thought we were in Flanders. The army began shelling the rebel positions. To the British, the rising was a stab in the back while Britain was at war. Their superior firepower soon began to crush the resistance of the rebels. I was then assigned to the roof where I remained for three days until the howitzers began to lob in incendiary shells on the roof. We fought the incendiary shells with the hose pipes until the water supply was cut off. Then we retreated to the upper floor and uh, a marksman and myself got into a corner on the Henry Street side and uh, we began to fire at uh, soldiers who were closing in on the upper end of the street. But the struggle was hopeless. After five days, the rebels surrendered. The leaders were taken to Dublin jails the rank and file to prison camps in Britain. When we finally surrendered, or went out to surrender, 
from Moore Street. Sean McDermott talked to us, said we had done very well, and to uh, remember that uh, those who were who had been the leaders were bound to be executed, and that the uh, mantle of of, uh, of rebellion passed on to us. When Pierce, Connolly and their tiny band of revolutionaries had marched out into the streets of Dublin, they knew they had no chance of military success. Their aim was to arouse the conscience of the Irish people in a gesture that was to have a lasting effect upon Ireland. On the first day, Pierce had read a declaration of the Irish Republic. The provisional government of the Irish Republic to the people of Ireland. In the name of God, and of the dead generations from which she receives her old tradition of nationhood. Ireland, through us, summons her children to her flag and strikes for her freedom. We declare the right of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland and to the unfettered control of Irish destinies to be sovereign and indefeasible. We hereby proclaim the Irish Republic as a sovereign, independent state. And we pledge our lives and the lives of our comrades in arms to the cause of its freedom. These prophetic words, invoking the past and looking to the future, were to echo through Irish history. What was now being proclaimed by the years of 1916 was pitched at a much higher level, a non-negotiable sovereign republic sanctified in blood and by all those who had been in jail. It was going to be much, much more difficult indeed to find a formula for solution with the negotiating terms for Irish independence and for Irish political rights pitched at such a level and now sanctified by such a background. The 1916 Rising was to be the beginning of the end of British rule in 26 of Ireland's 32 counties. Out of the ruins of Dublin, a new Ireland was soon to rise.